Today we're gonna to look at what we call movable chord shapes. Movable chord shapes are simply chords where all four strings are pushed down in some way so that if you were to move the entire chord up or down the fretboard, you would have the same quality chord and um, just the starting note would be different because you're sharpening or flatting it depending on how much you move it. It's an intermediate to advanced skill and um, we wouldn't expect you in this class to learn a whole bunch of them, but you will learn two to get you started on your way, sort of as a, um, you know, you should know about these things and you should be, you know, if you're gonna excel on the ukulele, you wanna, you wanna master these things because they allow you to do so much more uh, than be stuck with stock chords and home positions, which are great, but limiting. Uh, their simplicity is wonderful, but uh, they do present problems later. Let's have a look at this right here. This is a C7 chord, we know that. And I'm just gonna check the frame to make sure this is in here. Yeah, I guess so. That's a C, that's a, sorry, that's a G, that's a C, that's an E, and that's a B flat. And a C7 chord is a major triad, C, E, G, and a whole step below the C for the seventh, which is B flat. And we learned to play that very early on. If I were to sharp each one of those notes, that would mean I'd raise them one fret in this direction. That's what this diagram is here. And it would be called C sharp seven. Instead of a C major triad, it would have a C sharp major triad. And instead of a B flat, you'd sharp this and they cancel out and you get a B. So here's my G sharp. Here's my C sharp. Now careful, you wanna call this F cause that's what you're used to. But in this context, it's an E that's been sharped. So it's an E sharp. And this B flat, when you add a sharp to it, becomes B natural. So C sharp, E sharp, G sharp, and a B. Now, here you just use your first finger. Uh, I'll put this under the camera so you can see it. Just like that, yeah? Okay, and ostensibly the nut of the instrument is holding the, the strings to that length right there, right? Once you put your finger down on a fret, it holds the string down on the fret wire and it makes the string shorter and that's why the pitch goes up. So if I wanna go from here to here, what ends up happening is I have to switch fingers because this finger is gonna be responsible for holding all those guys down now, just like the nut did before, right? And then this one will move up. And if you hear C7, same sounding chord, just higher, C sharp, seven, okay? And then if we went up and sharp them again, we probably wouldn't call it C double sharp, that's not practical, but if you sharp C again, uh, C sharp again, it becomes D. So this would become a D seven chord. And now this note would be an A, because G sharp up a half step becomes A, C sharp becomes D. Now we're gonna flip. This was a E sharp or an F. We're gonna call it an F sharp because we know that D major triads have a D, F sharp, and an A. And this B up a half step becomes our C. And D seven is D, F sharp, A, a D major triad, and a whole step below the root, which is the C right there. And so here we go, C7, that blocks those all down to get those three notes there. C sharp seven, D seven, D sharp seven, E flat seven, E seven, F seven, and so on. It's a movable shape because none of the strings are left open to ring free, and as you move the other fingers around, then you get notes that are not part of the chord. That's a movable shape, right? So the first movable shape we're gonna teach you to do is D7. You already know the simple D7, right? But now you're gonna have the complete one of these. It gets used an awful lot, sounds really good. And here's how we'd write it. They would probably put a line through there or on the side like this. And you just put like a, a one right there. Right. If you see this like this right there, it means that those are bridged or barred together, right, with one finger like that, okay? Sometimes people will push that down with their next finger over and then put their third finger behind. If your architecture is right, meaning your hand shape is right, and you've got your thumb behind there, it's called cantilever, giving you the right kind of pressure, 
right? Then, and you know, that you're not like too flat in there, then you'll be able to cover all those and keep them ringing. If not, you'll be like, right? But D7. So whether you do this and throw that on there, like that, or you do this, okay? That's D7. Now, if you're having problems making it sound, like I said, you can do this, but your thumb has to be behind. If it's above, you're not gonna get even pressure on your finger across the fretboard, and you're gonna have to push way too hard, right? Minimum force necessary. We don't wanna hurt your wrist through too much constriction here. The thumb should be behind now so that you can get, you know, a proper purchase. You have to roll the hand back a bit so that the knuckles here are touching the strings all the way across the inside parts of your string right there. And just like that. As you practice, and we'll give you a practice assignment for this in a different video, it's okay if it sounds like to begin with, right? We don't want you pushing down prematurely hard and giving a lot of stress and tendonitis, causing kind of problems to your hand. Eventually, your technique will refine. But there's your first movable chord, D7. Now, in the midterm, you had to identify this chord, and we know it is D7 from playing it, but if you spelled out the notes correctly, which is the other part of it, you would have gone like, hey, that's an A, and that's a C, and that's an F sharp, and an A. And I put a comment saying, what is with that D7 chord not having any D in it? That's like saying, I'd like, I don't know, chocolate without any actual cocoa in it or something, like the main ingredient is gone. And <clears throat> there's two reasons why we do this. If you look on the internet, this will be called the easy or simple D7. Um, the reason why we do this is because it's easy to play. You don't have to learn how to bridge. It's just two fingers, you know. Here's the full D7 and the D7 we've been playing. They're both fine. They have slightly different sounds, and it's true that this actually has a D in it. The reason this works is because uh, it has the F sharp and the C in it, and it's the five chord for the key of G, okay? And I want you to think, I think I'm gonna draw this on here for you so you can see. Is this on here? It is. If I'm in the key of G, that means my one chord is G, which is G, B, D, right there. And that's home, right? My five chord is D7. It's D, F sharp, A, and a C. And if we rearrange these notes and listen to them, this F sharp pulls really hard to G. I apologize for the construction trucks going by my house, but you know, this is my garage, this is my, my teaching space, okay? And this seventh on the chord, C, pulls really, really hard to the B, and that's one of the reasons why the dominant seven chord has such a strong, powerful tendency to push us back to the one. So if we're listening to D7, it really wants to go to like that, right? This note right here, my C wants to go to the B, and my F sharp wants to go to the G. You put these two together, Those are the two, what we call tendency tones, or ones that have a tendency to push you to notes in the one chord. This chord right here has those in it. And so it does the job of actuating you towards the one chord. The other thing is, this is the seven chord in the key, and seven is a substitute for five sometimes um, because they do the same job. It's just not as, uh, as rich. It doesn't have the D in there as well. but. In the context of this, if I play a bunch of G chords, listen. Now you've got the key of G in your ears. And that's home. It's a G. We can play other chords, like um, here's A minor. Now when I go to my D7, it doesn't really matter which version I play. sharp and it's pulling me to G and 
that was the easy D7. It does the same job. Here's G again. Let's do C chord. That's my four chord. Now here's my D7, and it's the full version. There's still the F sharp that wants to go to Do, T, Do, to G, right? And there's my C. So it's incomplete, but it's enough in the context of the key of G. And rather than confuse people and say, oh, let's play F sharp diminished, which is what it is, right? Colloquially, let's just say it's a substitute for D7 going to the key of G, the G chord. Let's just call it a D7. That's it right there. Um, what else would we want to know about that? No, I think that's about it. You do this all the time in your life. If I say roses are red and violets are, even if you don't want to say blue and you want to be ironic, you know what I'm about to say next, because there's enough there. And in the context of a key of a G piece of music, when you hear this even without the D in it, it's enough to function like that five chord and pull it back. Okay, so movable shapes, you're just moving up. Now I'm gonna show you some more movable shapes. Uh, I'll probably keep it in a different video just so that this doesn't go long but you want to watch this one first and then move on.